evening. It is another amazing evening. Kind of gray here. Um, kind of acted like it wanted to rain all day, but it never did. But that's okay. God, God knows how much rain we need and when we need it. And I think we still have a chance for some. So I pray that this week is uh, going well for you all. Uh, we are going to hang around for just a little bit before we get started. Uh, it's obviously a few minutes early, but I just wanted to check in with everyone and see that you're all doing well. Uh, it has been a busy week uh, around here. Just lots of things happening. Uh, some things are starting to return uh, a little bit to normal, maybe, that uh, I, I get to have a few in-person meetings. And obviously for me, that does my heart uh, so much good to have in-person kind of meetings. Um, and so it has been good. It, 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 the weather, uh, it's hot. Uh, not as hot as for our friends in Arizona that are having no monsoon and are, uh, which means no rain, and are well over a hundred. So for our friends in Arizona, I'm sorry. Um, I'm glad we're not that warm, even though we're warm enough to, and with the humidity to, to be a little uncomfortable maybe. But um, I have to say, uh, today I... I put away some zucchini, and I think I have all that I maybe need for now anyway. Um, I, I, I put away enough to make quite a few loaves of bread and that kind of thing, and then I, it, come winter when I want to do that. So, But it's good. Um, I'm not going to complain about it, so I'm glad to have it. And... Uh, uh, but like I said, uh, the flowers are doing well. Our crops are doing well. Um, we need to keep our prayers for those in Iowa whose crops were decimated by that storm, the, the de, de, whatever, um, flatlined, flat, flatline winds, and that did a lot of destruction across um, a good share of Iowa. And so for those people, we say, and we lift our hearts and our prayers to them to let them know that we are with them in their struggle. And for farmers at this time of year to lose a whole crop, um, there were just thousands of acres that were, that were laid flat um, and buildings that were hurt and a few deaths. And so we want to keep our prayers on those people as we go through our week. Uh, don't forget to get your Bible, um, get your uh, drink of choice. Um, mine happens to be a Dr. Pepper, a really big one that I um, don't think I'm gonna finish it today. I think maybe it'll be another day before I get to that, but make sure and kind of settle in and we're gonna, um, we're gonna start answering some questions because I had some and then I was emailed a question. And I want to I wanna clarify, um, because I got a little confusion going on too. And so I started doing some research. And in fact, Ron laughed at me the other day because he walked in here into my office and spread out on my desk. There was, um, I had like my Bible and I think two other books a bunch of papers and a map. And he's like, he just kind of, he stood there looking at me and I'm like, I'm trying to figure out some things. I'm totally, totally, um, Noah has me, or this whole story of Genesis that I thought I knew has me totally, totally um, fascinated right now. So I'm really excited about um, trying to figure out some things that I never thought about and, and never even, I guess, never even questioned. I, I just made presumptions that things were as they were written and never thought about questioning it. And now it's, I'm, I'm doing the questioning. And, and so then um, 
a friend emailed me a question as well, and it was on my heart to figure it out because as I was reading it, it dawned on me things weren't making sense the way they were being presented. So I, I watched a video and I, I was looking at all these commentations and I had some other papers I had pulled off, um, some other resources that I had pulled from the internet. And like I said, I had to go find a map as well. And that's for this week's um, that I had to go find a map because I needed to figure out where some things were. So um, we're going to wait just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. But um, yeah, yeah, life kind of got interesting, didn't it? Um, as we as we dig deeper. And in fact, um, I happened to be teaching a CPR class the other day. And as I was ending, I said, well, this is just my um, trivia fact for all of you. And you know, it was a group of um, Lutheran teachers. And I said, did you know that um, Noah did not shut the ark up? that God slammed that door. And they all looked at me. And I have a feeling they went to their pastor, who's a friend of mine, and probably had to ask him. But it was it was just kind of funny because they had the same reaction I think we all did of, well, but we've read that story a bajillion times and never quite got that one little piece, never struck us and hit us in the face like it did um, this, that week. So it was kind of fun to be able to share that trivia, Bible trivia. It's just like at seminary before I could leave uh, to go on internship, I had to take a Bible trivia test. And really, um, they gave us the test, gave, or gave us, you know, the study guide and the answers and all that. And I, I don't know. But I, I chuckled because what I remember is about um, Jeremiah's scribe. Okay, I always think about Jeremiah had a bullfrog. But anyway, Jeremiah's scribe's name was Baruch. Now, why that one name stuck in my head, I don't know. But isn't that funny how we have those things happen and we kind of go, oh, that was kind of odd, but that's okay. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we'll probably have some, I know we'll have some other friends join us as we go through um, this next half hour or so. So let's begin with prayer. God, you continue to journey with us through looking at our roots as we've gone back to the beginning, back to Genesis, to read and to learn and to hear your story played out. We know, God, that you are present and have been from the dawning of the ages, from the very beginning of creation. So God, be with us tonight. Open our hearts and our minds that we may learn again as we read your story, which is our story to tell. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, here's what I want to clarify. I, I I think I've been pondering even the whole vegetarian thing and Ron and I even talked about that and he's like, well, I don't think I can give up meat. And I'm like, we don't have to give up meat. I said, the vegetarian was in Genesis 1. That was before the ark. After the ark, we were given permission to eat meat. So we that one we've clarified. What I want us to think about is, and we're gonna and we're gonna find it as we come into the Tower of Babel. There is confusion about what we have already read. We already read by as we came through kind of the table of nations, as we came through chapter 10, and, and it repeated itself that these are the sons of after their clans, after their tongues, by their lands, by their nations. And it, when they were on the ark together, especially when it was, you have to remember, it was Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, and Yepeth, and their wives. They're, they would have been speaking the same language. So they come off, and as their clans are being formed, it sounds like we have 
different languages being spoken. And there may have been. What we have to remember, and this is so important, that as we're reading scripture, that the Bible was not written chronologically. So what happens at the very beginning in Genesis to Revelation is not chronological. And even as Moses was writing Genesis, and, and as this story unfolds, is not always chronological. Sometimes we have to think about that there's th some thematic issues that are happening. Um, topical writings, they all did speak. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, chronologically by time, or back, chron chronology is by time. Chronos um, is where we get time. So we're talking about the thematic writing of scripture does not always speak in, in time order, okay? Uh, I know that's confusing, but I think at times we have to remember the way scripture is being put together. And you have to remember, they weren't writing it down that on day one, day two, day three, and the order is sometimes from the perspective of the writer. And that's why we get a little bit of difference um, or maybe significant difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is because from a different perspective, they see things. Well, we're also experiencing that as we think about that thematic writing was happening. Okay, so up through chapter 10, they are all speaking the same language, okay? Even when they come off, and, and let's remember, this is not a huge amount of time between them coming off the ark and, and Babel starting to happen. Um, in fact, let me just look here. If I can find in my notes real quick, I don't know if I can, um, how soon we had, um, I can't. Um, how soon we had Babel happening. It doesn't sound like it's very long. Um, if we, let's look at chapter 11 is where we're going to start reading. And so I want us to think about that. If we're thinking thematically versus chronologically in chronos and time, does that make a difference? So at this point, as they're coming off, they are all still speaking the same language. Now it says, after their tongues, by their lands, by their nations. But that me that that is the language of Shem Hem Yippeth as they're coming off the ark and as that's being as all that's still happening. Okay? So let's put that in our head. So let's start with uh, chapter eleven, verse one. And here's where I think it cleared it up for me a little bit as I was also then doing the rest of the research. Now, all the earth was of one language and one set of words, okay? Now, you have to remember, this is in Mesopotamia. You might want to, at some point, pull out a map um, of that part of the world, and Mesopotamia kind of runs um, from the Persian Gulf, um, above Kuwait, um, up north, I know, this doesn't help any, but Mesopotamia kind of runs up this way, okay? I know, that was kind of silly, but um, you might want to pull a map out, um, or in your Bible, back your Bible may have a map. So this is all happening in Mesopotamia, and it is significant, Um Ver, and, and why it's, well, let's go on for a minute, and then I'm going to back up. Verse 2, and it was when they migrated to the east that they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. This is the region of Babylon, is where this is. Um, these are the descendants of Ham, who have gone to Babylon, into the region of Babylon, and are settling there. And so this is about his, um, his story, in a way, right now. So verse 3, 
they, the descendants of Ham, said, each man to his fellow, come now, let us bake bricks and let us burn them well burnt. So for them, brickstone was like building stone and raw bitumen was for them like red mortar. They didn't have anything to start building with, so they had to learn how to make from their prior history. Okay, except that they, outside of, well, they would have. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Yepeth would have had history of how to make things from before the flood. Verse 4. Now they said, come now. Uh, we just cannot catch a break, can we? Here we are. We're starting to think again. We're starting to say, wait a minute. We know what we need to do better than. Okay? Come now. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower. It's top in the heavens. And let us make ourselves a name lest we be scattered over the face of all the earth. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're starting to get a little bit of a rebellion against God, already starting, because now we're wanting to build a tower to heaven. Now, one thing we need to remember is that probably there were seven or eight babbles Okay, and that's what archaeologists have found um, remnants of. And they, they're, they're, it, it's kind of like in our world today, how many Osceola or Osceolas do we have around the country? Well, I know of three. One in Iowa, one in Nebraska, and one in Missouri. Now, if there's three, there's probably a few more states who haven't, Osceola or Osceola, depending on where we live, name another town. So there are seven or eight babbles that they have found archaeologically at this point. Okay, but they're trying now, they want to build a fortress. They want to steal God's glory away from him at this point. Now, this one happens to be, and this is why I had to go pull a map out, is, um, is in Eridu, Eridu, E-R-I-D-U, which is south and maybe a little west of Ur. Now, Ur is where Abraham would have been born. So there is significant significance here. But they think that Eridu, E-R-I-D-U, was the first metropolis of the lower Mesopotamian area that was in existence at about 4,000 B.C. There was a temple on earth there, and it's the oldest religious structure known to man is in Eridu, okay? So, and that's why I was pulling the map out, because I needed to visualize in Mesopotamia where this would have been. So, and, and I don't know, you know, I'm, I don't like doing this, because I know you can't really see where I'm at, but you might pull a map out. I mean, if you're looking at a map, it'll be north of Kuwait, north and west of Kuwait. Um, I don't know what else to tell you to find it, but um, it is interesting to see and realize that Ur is, is where Abraham was born. So we're talking about Babel, our Tower of Babel that we're talking about being right in that region. Also remember that there were many, many buildings built in the structure of what Tower of Babel would have looked like. And it would have been kind of pyramid-y looking, not really a true pyramid. Um, I'm not sure if we get dimensions. I don't think we do. Um, but uh, they're called zig ziguratus. 
Okay, Z-I-G-G-U-R-R-A-T-U. Ziggurats. Um, actually, they are basically found in all lands. Um, the Maya and the Incas, um, the building, the structure they did, um, is very much a ziggurato. So we have them all over the, I mean, they're all over the world in all lands. So it's not like that they're not around um, and haven't been unearthed. So, okay. See, I just got really fascinated by some of this this week. Okay, verse five. But Yahweh, but Yahweh, get it, came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. Hmm. Of course, he was seeing it from above. But he had to come down and look because he was seeing the defiance of the people and doing the opposite of what God had asked when they came off the ark was to give thanks for their life. Because, see, the people just wanted to enhance their own fame. It was all about ego. It was all about the humans. We cannot get away from this sin thing, can we? Okay. So, verse 6. Yahweh said, Here they are, one people with one language for them all. And this is merely the first of their doings. Now there will be no barrier for them in all that they devise to do. Hmm. Okay. Verse 7. Come now. Oh, okay, this is Yahweh still talking. Come now. Let us, did you catch the us there? Let us go down there. Let us baffle their language so that no man will understand the language of his fellow. Huh. Let us. It's a recall to Genesis 1. It is a reminder of the Trinity It is a reminder back. God is three in one. But God says, let us go down now because these silly people, what am I going to do with them? Okay, well, I'm going to baffle them now for good. I'm going to make it really difficult for them. So verse eight. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of all the earth, and they had to stop building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, Babel, for there Yahweh baffled the language and all of all the earth folk, and from there Yahweh scattered them over the face of all the earth. Okay, Babalu, or which means the gate of God, um, in Babylonian language. In Hebrew, it's not the gate of God, but it's to confuse, which sounds makes more sense. Babel is about confusing them because now they cannot understand each other in language. The, the communication that they had is now broken because they have broken the covenant with God. They broke it. That wasn't God breaking. They broke the covenant with God and wanted to get more powerful. It's a godless society. There's persecutions, there's sin, there's superstitions, there's, there's just everything. It's going the wrong way. The people have turned within themselves. They have consumed themselves to be more important in a way this is where I think when in verse 8 that everyone according to his own language when the when God scatters them is now when the tribes the clans go 
in their in their own languages and their own clans. This is where I think this is the thematic. We have to not look at the chronology. If we do, we're not going to we're not going to have the story. Okay? So I think this is this is accurate from that standpoint. See, I think that God baffled the language too in order that they would not be able to do evil together. Because between them all, look at what they were doing. They got themselves in a big old mess. In a big old mess. And God's going to separate. It's kind of like I think this is maybe like we do with our children, isn't it? We have to put them in time out and separate them because they're doing, e they're doing bad things with, they're hitting someone or um, little ones. or yeah, And so you have to separate them. We have to baffle them a little bit or confuse them a little bit. Set the boundaries so that they know what's what they're going to do. This is maybe that I think this, for me, becomes maybe a segue into thinking about Pentecost. Because here in Genesis, in, verse, in chapter 11, verse 9, we're seeing the people scattered to all places, to all regions, and they can't understand each other. And remember that God and the triune are all there. They're all there. They've all come down to see this. But what happens at Pentecost? At Pentecost, we have all present again. And now they can all hear each other in their language. The story flips because God now lets us come back together after he separates them and puts them in time out for a little while. Actually, it's quite a, it's a long while, isn't it? It's a long time, but it's okay. Okay. Now, we have this interlude in here because now we're going to come back to Shem. Because um, we get the beginnings of Shem again. Well, we just had Shem in 10... Chapter 10, verses 21 to 31, we had Shem mentioned, and now we're getting him again. Um, there is a reason for that, and I think that is because of his importance to the Abraham story. Huh. I, he is a little bit important, since this is all the lineage from where Abraham, Abraham is going to come from. So let's begin on verse 10. And this is all pointing to Israel now. So starting here, we're going to see um, kind of the story pointing itself to Abraham. Okay. These are the beginnings of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he begat Archiphaz, two years after the deluge. And Shem lived after he begot Archiphaz, 500 years, and he begot other sons and daughters. Archbishad lived 35 years, and he begat Shiloh. And Archbishad lived after he begat Shelah, I mean Shelah, begot Shelah three years and 400 years, and begot other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 30 years, then he begot ever. We're going to start to see some things happen. We're going to see that the firstborn are at about the age of 30, about the same age a lot of our women today are having babies. The other thing we're going to start to see is the life expectancy is starting to shrink a little bit. It's going to decrease. So we're going to see a little bit of this. We have to remember, these are a group of folks that are now, that are entering into a very in a way, a very evil time. There's a lot of ungodliness going on. Polytheism, adultery. Um, there is, even though this is the lineage from which Abraham comes from, a time that is very unsettled in, in, in culture. So verse 15. And Shelah lived after he begot ever three years and 400 years and begot other sons and daughters. Whenever he had lived, 34 years, he begot Peleg. See how it's the 30s are starting to creep in. 
and ever lived after he begot Peleg 30 years and 400 years, and he begot other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he begot Reu, and Peleg lived after he begot Reu nine years and 200 years and begot other sons and daughters. Now, let me give you Reu um, means friend. And so it, it apparently is a fairly common name um, that was used, but it means friend. So when Reu had lived, this is where the interesting part comes and some genealogy starts to creep in for us that I think is really fascinating. Um, when Reu had lived 32 years, he begot Serug. And Reu lived after he begot Serug seven years and 200 years and begot other sons and daughters. Okay, Serug, or Serug, is the great grandfather to Abraham. Now, his name in Greek was changed to S A R U C H, um, Saruk, maybe. But he's the great grandfather to Abraham. Okay? Verse 22. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he begot Nahor. And so Sarug lived after he begot Nahor 200 years and begot other sons and daughters. Now, Nahor is the grandfather to Abraham. Okay, the grandfather to Abraham, and his name means snoring. Now, I wonder if he snored a lot. I don't know. It's always interesting. I love looking at what the names mean. Um, I think there's something about that that um, is just fascinating. Now, in a way, and we're going to go on here in a minute, but uh, the Noah lineage in chapter 5 kind of parallels the Shem um, lineage in a way. Genesis 10 is about the tower and the God in all nations. Genesis 11 is about Abraham and God in Israel. So there's we have some parallels, and if you... Um, I haven't taken the time to go back and really look at that. Okay, but it'd be interesting to kind of do. Verse 24... When Nahor had lived 29 years, he begot Terah, and Nahor, and Nahor lived after he begot Terah 19 years and 100 years, and begot other sons and daughters. Now, Terah was an adulterer, and this is a wonderful group of people we're putting together. Isn't that a wonderful story? I, you know, I, there's comfort in knowing that the people of our history and our roots were just like you and me. They were not perfect. They were like you and me. We are the same kind of people. So Terah was an adulterer. And when Terah had lived 70 years, he begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay. Abram is mentioned first. He is not the oldest, but because of his lineage, because who he becomes, he is mentioned first. Now, in my Bible, Av it, this is before the name change. So Abram is A-V-R-A-M, or it may be A-B-R-A-M in your Bibles. But all three of these, you notice not all the names of all the kids are ever mentioned because there's a significance in the names that are mentioned. And all three of these um, are going to, to um, be significant in the story of Avram. Now, Avram, A-V-R-A-M, in Hebrew means exalted father. Okay, that is not the same as when his name changes to Abraham. Because Abraham means the fa father of a great multitude. So we have here, Avram is an exalted father. And after his name changed, he becomes a f the father of a great multitude. Okay, the name change does make a difference. 
in the meaning of that name. Okay. Verse 27. Now these are the beginnings of Terah. Terah begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Yeah, I'd almost like to have a playbook of how all these characters fit into the story, because they all fit in. We know where Lot goes into this story, too. Now, Haran died in the presence of Terah, his father, in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Ur is a significant city. It was 10 miles west of the Euphrates River and 200 miles southeast of Baghdad. It was a major metropolis. It was a very wealthy city. It would have been a central um, uh, merchandising and that kind of thing. There would have been a cultural center. And so it's interesting, um, which we know is where Abraham was born. Well, we do from here. Uh, but he died, uh, um, it was kindred, um, verse 28, Haran died in the presence of Terah, his father, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Avram and Nahor took themselves wives. The name of Avram's wife was Sari. Now remember, this was before the name change for Avram and Sari. I'm going to have to look up what Sari, Sari's name meant before, because I can't remember what it is. The name of Nahor's wife was Melka, daughter of Haran. Okay, Melka, again, we need to almost put a red mark by her name. Melka is the grandmother of Rebecca, who marries Isaac. Now, this is kind of like going to the family reunion and not having a clue about who's who. I don't know about you, but I cannot keep some of my nieces and nephews, or um, my, my cousin's kids, straight. I, I, I just can't keep them straight. I'm not sure who's who for part of the kids. And I think that's kind of what I feel like now. Okay, so the name of Nahor's wife was Milka, daughter of Haran, father of Milka, and father of Yiska. Now, Sarah, oh, wait a minute, Sari, I did find it. it her, her name, Sari, means contentious. Well, if you think about it, that seems perfectly like a good meaning to her name, contentious. That changes, but contentious. And she was barren, and she had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot, son of Haran, his son's son, and Sari, his daughter-in-law, wife of Abram, his son, and they set out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. Basically, they went um, to Iraq, into that region. But when they had come as far as Haran in southeast Turkey, they settled there. And the days of Terah were 500 years and 200 years. Then Terah died in Haran. Um, the Ur of the Chaldeans uh, was about, was another Babylon, was about 70 miles south of Baghdad. Um, which is interesting because where they set out towards is where Saddam um, had parked his planes before. So it's kind of interesting when you start looking at that region and where our story is in the midst of um, political, geopolitical kind of things going on. So um, here's an interesting fact as we kind of end our time, and this is a good place to stop before we get into the patriarchal uh, narratives, but if you add up from Adam to Abram, uh, Abram there's uh, 1,948 years from Adam to Abram, okay? So, and Adam was the pro is the promise to all believers, is really who he is, the Adam, is the promise to all believers. 
Israel, which is where we're headed for, is the promise to all Jews, and Israel was born in the year 1948, in our time. Coincidence? No. There's no coincidences that happen. It's God instances that there's 1,948 years between Adam and Abram. And then that Israel was born in 1948. God's time, not chronology, not chronos. My dear friends, it has been a delight and this time goes so fast. If you have questions, please send them through Messenger. Send them to me by email. Oh, pick up the phone and call me. I love having those conversations too. And it spurs interesting that we may not get very far, but it sure is fun to dig into facts and details. Find out about our story our story from the very beginning. And now, my friends, may you go in peace. May God walk with you. May he walk beside you. May he walk along with you and carry you in times of need. May he be with you in all that you do. And may he bless you all your days. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Have a great evening, my friends. See you Sunday or next Wednesday. Bye.